thank you all for being here. Um, I'm not actually going to be talking much about technology today. I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. Uh, and what I'm going to do, as academics often do, is I'm going to talk about um, not about issues that are under discussion today, but I think about issues that are, to my mind, emerging issues and things that we need to think about for the coming years. Um, I'm going to be talking about two particular topics, as my title suggests, which is what I call protecting the vulnerable and thinking about compensation for impacts. So, on the first front, uh, on protecting the vulnerable, I want to just put up for a second some uh, extracts from the uh, Article 3 of the Framework Convention, talks about the principles, and I want to actually specifically emphasize the second bullet point here that says that we must give full consideration to the specific needs and special circumstances of developing country parties, especially those that are politically vulnerable and bear a disproportionate or abnormal burden. And then the uh, convention also talks about the precautionary approach. So I'm going to take two examples of groups that I think are particularly vulnerable in, in uh, what is going to be an emerging climate uh, regime, uh, regardless of even if it's even if we undertake uh, aggressive mitigation, there are groups that are going to be uh, fairly vulnerable. The first one is a, is a group of uh, communities across the world that are relating to food and agriculture security. Uh, groups, basically, uh, a large number of undernourished people already existing in the world, approximately a billion. Pretty amazing. This number has, has fluctuated a little bit in the last few years, but really has stayed at this large number. Um, and the problem is that in the past few years, actually the number of undernourished people in the world has gone up for a number of reasons, market volatility, uh, production constraints, actually biofuels demand, and even the financial crisis. But most important than all, high prices affect the poor, since they are net buyers of food. And climate change is likely to make this problem worse. Uh, because climate may impact both the production of food as well as, as, as prices. At the same time, there are about 450 small older farmers worldwide and their families that are particularly at risk from climate change. And therefore, this way, we have this group both of vulnerable consumers of food and producers that we have to, we have to think about that are getting some attention in, in the climate discussion, but not as much as I believe they should. The second group is what I would call climate refugees. Uh, these are basically habitats of large number of poor people are going to be affected by climate change. Uh, examples such as sea level rise or uh, climate related disasters. We actually don't have very uh, accurate estimates of what these numbers might look like. There's a broad number of a range of estimates. But the most widely cited number is approximately of about 200 million refugees by uh, 2050. And this number, by the way, is equal to the current estimate of total international migrants worldwide. So we might be seeing huge numbers of people across the world. Uh, and this is a grave concern, not just for the people, but also for, for uh, averting areas and countries. Actually, many countries are thinking of this as potential international security implications. So, at least to my mind, there's an urgent need to focus on vulnerable communities. And these issues in communities are common to and important for a number of non-Annex 1 countries. So this, to my mind, is an issue that actually spans countries. And we have to think about uh, maybe out-of-the-box ways of thinking about these particular groups, rather than focusing only at country-level solutions. Uh, one example that actually has been put out by some Australians is uh, a potential uh, idea of a convention for people displaced by climate change as a way to think about climate refugees. I think a slightly uh, a radical solution, but we might have to start thinking about these kind of solutions. Uh, and at the same time, cooperation between Annex, to my mind, between Annex 1 and non-Annex 1 on these kind of uh, questions, of these vulnerable communities, uh, which nobody, I think, can disagree with, maybe a way to build confidence, and therefore also, in a sense, kind of help advance the larger climate agenda. Second question that I want to put out here is compensation for impacts. We all know that climate-related impacts are uh, kind of an increasing trend, and they're here to stay. Actually, regardless of what mitigation measures we may take, uh, I shouldn't say whatever, but whatever practical or realistic mitigation measures we may take, uh, we are going to have see, be seeing climate impacts. And in fact, emission trends are worrisome. Worry Last year, the emissions went up uh, by about 5%, and we've reached a record high emissions by now. And so this fair amount of concern that we may be actually uh, not be able to avoid dangerous climate change. Um, 
the, the recent report by IPCC's, uh, the special report on extreme events, uh, says that extreme event weather events are likely to worsen. And uh, in fact, this is some data from that report that actually shows that there are significant uh, economic losses from, from these climate-related disasters. The losses have increased, but with large, large variations. And we find that economic costs, while well, the economic costs are higher than Annex 1 countries, uh, in non-Annex 1 countries, these costs are higher as a fraction of GDP. So it actually hits the economies harder. And in terms of mortality, most of the mortalities, in fact, almost 95% of the mortalities from climate-related disasters are in non-Annex 1 countries. Who should cover the costs of these increasing impacts? And I think that's an important question that really is not being talked about as much as it needs to. So to my mind, at least, the next frontier in discussions on equity really is about climate liability. I think there's a conversation that's starting now this, you know, on loss and damage, for example, under the convention. But I think we really need to think about this issue much more aggressively. Um, we actually see in, 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 the, in, the, in the legal arena, there are past, many past examples of liability for health, uh, and environmental damages, and I put up some examples there, tobacco, asbestos, Exxon Valdez, Superfund, which is a US uh, uh, regime, a uh, regulatory regime for preventing, uh, uh, both preventing environmental damages, but also uh, liability for damages. To my mind, climate liability actually serves two functions, thinking about that. It's rightly a source of compensation to victims, but also it's a disincentive to polluters. Um, there are a number of questions about climate liability. Uh, questions of what's called justiciability. You know, is this a, a, an issue for courts to decide? Uh, standing, who is the one who can actually bring uh, a lawsuit on climate damages? And what's the burden of proof? Uh, this is the notion of detection and attribution. What is a climate-related disaster? And who do, how, how do we, how can we attribute any uh, causality? But, uh, there are a number of cases that are being filed across the world uh, that are beginning to explore this notion of climate liability and even getting some traction in, in, the, in the courts. Um, and I think, to my mind, this is a parallel to the tobacco arena where it took a while for uh, di different kinds of co uh, cases to be filed in, in the courts. And then finally, actually, I think the courts started understanding and, and even as the science evolved, started, started uh, uh, putting out remedies that were actually uh, uh, bringing justice to the plaintiffs. And more recently, actually, other, other things have started happening. For, uh, for example, uh, insurance uh, GHG polluters, uh, a very recent case, actually, where an insurance company actually said that they will actually not provide coverage anymore to a GHG polluter for against climate lawsuits and for liability claims. Uh, and the courts upheld the insurer's uh, right to not provide this kind of, uh, this kind of insurance coverage. So to my mind, at least, there is a case for exploring climate liability. Uh, and I think here, I actually, as a researcher, I think we must start thinking about what the, what the uh, approach is that might make sense, which legal remedies make sense. Lawyers have to think about that. Who are the right kind of plaintiffs? Who are the defendants? And how do we think about allocating costs of impacts among the dependents, uh, defendants? And how do you link climate science to law? I think these are all open questions now, but looking forward, I think these are the kind of things we want to think about. If one have, have to do uh, what, I, to my mind, is an important part of climate justice, which is uh, really thinking about uh, compensating victims. To my mind, this is somewhat parallel to the conversations on geoengineering, where we are talking about geoengineering, exploring geoengineering as an insurance scheme, just in case. Well, just in case we have uh, climate impacts that become very, very significant, uh, we have to think about compensating the victims. Uh, so to my mind, this is another exploration that's equally necessary. So to my mind, I'll just end by saying that while we have not seen liability as a pillar of equity, I think in the coming years, we should consider it as a third pillar of equity beyond conversational mitigation and adaptation. Thank you.